All right, everybody, thanks for being here tonight. We're going to do part two of the basal ganglion. So let's let's go through a few things, and then we're going to talk about some how to how to test it. And then next week will be how to actually do some treatment options. But if we don't know what we're looking for, we're never going to find it. So let, let's talk just briefly here about some anatomy. Uh, we've got, and we've got to bring up this anatomy just simply because of the uh, uh, we, if we don't understand your uh, anatomy, we're not going to know how, what all of this means and, and how to test and treat it. Now, don't forget that in the mesencephalon, we've got the mesencephalon, pons, and medulla. The mesencephalon, we've got this little uh, black strip here that's called the substantia nigra pars compacta. This is where our dopamine is made. Now, we also have a red nucleus on the right and left side. We have cranial nerve three and four. Okay, this has to do with vertical eye movements. This is actually how we can test this and treat uh, these early Parkinson's symptoms because what will happen, these people start to, they, their center of pressure, they feel as though they're back. Okay, they're, they're falling back. So what they'll do is they'll actually start to flex forward. So this is why they have that flex forward. And also they can't saccade upward or they can't pursue upward. So whenever you have them do saccade, instead of looking where my finger is here, it's like they'll look here. So they'll just saccade up here. The reason that's important is because cranial nerve three and four, okay, control vertical eye movements, uh, three and six, which is in the pontine paramedian reticular formation. This is down here. Uh, that's your horizontal. We're not gonna talk about that except for what I just went over with you. We're going to talk about vertical eye movements, um, three and four. And what controls the vertical eye movements is the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. So see, again, if we know what's in the mesencephalon, none of this happens in isolation. You don't just have slowness of movement. We don't just have slowness of movement in our tremor. We, we have slowness of movement and a tremor. Then we have shoulders that don't work. Why? Because the red nucleus controls the contralateral shoulder. So we, get to, we lose this arm swing. Why do we lose vertical eye movement? Because cranial nerve three and four is in the mesencephalon. So again, uh, if we recap, I'm sorry, uh, anyway, uh, from last week, we said we've got this vagus nerve that comes up and then it starts, this, this alpha synuclein climbs up this, this vagus nerve, okay? And then when it gets up here, one of the things that it starts to destroy uh, is going to be our uh, substantia nigra pars compacta. So if you'll think of it like we take an eraser here and we start erasing part of this, okay, through here, and the more of this we erase, okay, of course, the slower we start to get because the dopamine, the dopaminergic pathway leans more toward what is called D1 or the direct pathway. Uh, acetylcholine has to do more with D2 or the indirect pathway. So this is one of the reasons why we start to slow down typically first because, because of the dopaminergic uh, pathways that are damaged. So uh, the areas that we're going to be looking at here in the mesencephalon, red nucleus, right and left, substantia nigra pars compacta gets depleted, vertical eye movements. And then right here in the center, we have what is called the ventral tegmental nucleus. And what this ventral tegmental nucleus does is it takes dopamine and then it uh, shunts it to the uh, cortex, uh, the limbic system, okay, the cortex uh, and our limbic system and our basal ganglion. All right, so that's going to be important. All right, so let's go over the anatomy of the basal ganglion. Now, this is going to be tricky, and I do mean real tricky here. This is why very few people actually uh, understand the basal ganglion. All right, now. The reason I say that is just work with me for just a second. We're going to start with this, ner uh, this uh, nerve here, <clears throat> that, and we're going to call this B. So we'll just take B here. We're going to take it all the way down. All right, so there's going to be three examples here. Now, neuron A, okay, all right, if neuron A fires to neuron B, and we're going to say that neuron B is an excitatory neurotransmitter. This is important, so we've got to understand this. Uh, neuron B is going to produce what is called glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So if neuron A, okay, its job is to excite neuron B, this is a real simple system. Then neuron B is going to excite neuron C and bring it to threshold and excite that neurological system. Now, if neuron B is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, okay, then what happens is when neuron A 
when neuron A, okay, is a positive, okay, and it excites, and then listen to what I'm saying, neuron A excites neuron B, but neuron B is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. What neuron B is going to do is it's going to fire to neuron C and it's going to inhibit it. All of this is simple stuff. So if you're confused, you get to go back and watch this because it's about to get cray cray right now. Okay. So here we have neurons, neuron B. Neuron B is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Here, what we have is neuron A is also a, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So neuron A, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, fires to neuron C, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what this means is we've got a, a negative firing to a negative, which cancels that. Think of it like this. If you have a, a, a negative times a negative, what do we end up with? We end up with a positive. Okay. This is called in neurology disinhibition. It means that this, this neuron B right here is a tonic. Uh, inhibitor. It's producing GABA tonically. But see, if you have a uh, neuron A inhibits an inhibitory pathway, then it takes the brake, takes the foot off the brake, and we actually excite this postsynaptic uh, neurotransmitter. So just recap, if neuron A is an excitatory neurotransmitter, it fires a neuron C and it's an, an excitatory neurotransmitter. Pretty simple. A plus times a plus equals uh, a plus or an excitatory neurotransmitter. We've, we've got neuron A as an excitatory neurotransmitter. It fires to neuron C, but when you excite neuron C, what it does, it releases GABA, which is going to inhibit the postsynaptic uh, neuron. Here, we've got inhibition of inhibition, which actually means that we're going to excite the C. All right, so that's basically the big picture here. Now, when we start to put the anatomy of the basal ganglion together, what we're going to be looking at here is the last pathway, okay? That inhibition of inhibition equals excitation. So you've got to keep that in mind. This is why nobody teaches this and nobody actually understands it because of the, all of this disinhibition that's going on. So let me drop this down here just a little bit. So if we draw our brain here, not to scale, of course. Um, all right, so we've got this brain here. All right. All right. Here we've got our corpus callosum and our, uh, 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 our, our uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Please forgive me. Uh, the lateral ventricles. I'll get it out in just a minute. Okay. So in here we've got a thalamus. Okay. Right next to that lateral ventricle. All right. Then we have what is called the um, uh, Neostratum. The neostratum consists of two parts, the putamen or the uh, caudate and putamen. So we have one of these on the left and the right side. Caudate is out here, putamen is a little bit more medial. And then we have uh, what is called our uh, globus pallidus pars externus and internus. So don't try not to confuse this too much because we got an externus, which is lateral, internus is more medial. And the last one, the last player, the character in the game here is our subthalamic nucleus. Okay, this is the last player in the game tonight. All right. All right, so let's look at this. <clears throat> so first thing we're going to do is draw out the direct pathway. The direct pathway is what gives us the oomph. Boom, we want to move. Boom. Uh, you know, say, take your finger, put it on your nose. And instead of doing this, the person is like, really, really slow, or we do rock, paper, knife, and the, and the person's like really, really slow, okay? The direct pathway is to give us this oomph, okay, this movement, the amplitude. So if somebody has the direct, indirect pathway that's off, they're going to be like this. They're going to be going real slow, really, really slow. And then one of the things they can have is hypomemia, which they start to lose facial tone, and then they start to uh, lose their voice, uh, and it's like... <laughs> Okay, and they almost sound like they're screaming. That's just a few of the symptoms of this, but the people, they're going to slow down. They're going to have loss of arm swing. They've already had gut motility problems, all of that before they get into this, this area up here. So dopamine, all right, so let's talk about this. Our cortex, let's back up. I said core, uh, dopamine, but we're going to talk about our cortex. So 
cortex, all lobe to the cortex, fire through your basal ganglion, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, limbic system. All of these fire through this basal ganglion. Okay, so the way this works here, and just that we let's go through this. The cortex is going to fire when it gets excited. It's going to fire to the neostriatum. Here, I'm just going to draw it to the uh, the caudate, but it fires to the caudate and the patamen. All right. Now, what will happen in this situation? Let's back up just a second. The globus pallidus pars internus is a tonic inhibitor. This is extremely important. It's a tonic inhibitor. So this globus pallidus pars internus always has the break on, okay? And it's going to have the break on the thalamus. It's going to tell the thalamus, you know, stop doing what you're doing, all right? But all right, so the cortex is going to fire to the caudate. The caudate, when it fires, is going to fire an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's going to fire this inhibitory neurotransmitter to the globus pallid as far as internus. So what did we say when you have inhibition of inhibition? Inhibition of inhibition, what this does is it actually excites the thalamus and it fires it back to the cortex and goes, boom, let's move. You know, let's let's get into motion here. Let's move this thing. So this is our direct pathway. Our direct pathway leans more toward dopamine, okay? So uh, the dopaminergic pathways fire this system, all right? So the cortex, and when I said cortex, remember we're talking about all lobes of the cortex, fire to the caudate and putamen. I just drew it to the caudate here. The caudate and putamen, what they're going to do is they're going to fire an inhibitory neurotransmitter to the globus pallidus pars internus, the globus pallidus pars internus tonically inhibits the thalamus. So again, if we take the brake off the thalamus, then boom, the thalamus fires back to the cortex and excites it. So I'm standing here, we're talking about the right brain. So the right brain, everything I've talked about so far is gonna fire to the left side of the body. So if the left side of the body is slowing down, we're probably thinking of an indirect pathway of I'm sorry, a direct pathway to the basal ganglion. All right, so let's talk about the indirect pathway. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do it on this side, but remember there's an indirect and direct pathway on this side. But if I draw it over here, it's gonna look like a uh, Chicago crime scene. All right, and we don't want that. So this is a mess, messy enough as it is. So we've got our cortex, and we're gonna we're gonna fire this time through the indirect pathway to slow things down. And I don't mean like slow things, it's the agonist antagonist. We can't be full throttle all the time. Something has to gate that. So the cortex again is going to fire and it's going to excite the caudate and putamen, all right? Now here, what's going to happen, this is gonna fire. Just remember, once we get into the basal ganglion, everything is inhibitory except the subthalamic nucleus. So if you'll just write that down, everything in the basal ganglion is inhibitory except for the subthalamic nucleus. So this caudate, what it's going to do is it's going to fire to the globus pallidus pars externus. Now, this globus pallidus pars externus now is going to fire to the substantia nigra pars compacta. <laughs> All right, so inhibition of inhibition, what this is going to do is this will cause the substantia nigra to fire into the uh, uh, let me back up here. Sorry about that. It doesn't fire into the thalamus. It actually fires into the uh, globus pallidus pars externus. What does the globus pallidus pars externus do? Globus in internus. I'm sorry, I'll get my language right here in a minute. Globus pallidus pars internus. What does it do? It tonically inhibits the thalamus. So now this system is going to fire back to the cortex and actually inhibit it. Okay. So it, so just think of it like this. The direct pathway gives things, it gives it oomph, boom, fire. But guess what happens when it goes in the opposite direction when it starts to malfunction? Things start to slow down, all right? Then we get over here in this indirect pathway, which is supposed to modulate things to make sure we have the right amount of movement, okay? And then when this system goes down, what happens here is we move too much. Okay, so here you got a person that's going to go like that, maybe not have Parkinson's, but they got a direct indirect pathway, excuse me, indirect pathway that's not working properly, and they're like this. I literally have had people hit their legs so so hard on their quadriceps that they actually are eliciting the uh, L4 patellar reflex. This is no lie. I've actually seen this. 
Okay, so this is another one where people will just say, put your finger on your nose, and these people are like this. Okay, it's like, oh, pump the brakes just a little bit, go slower. Okay, so that's an indirect pathway. And then whenever we have somebody with a direct pathway, remember direct pathway gives us the oomph. But if we lose that, then we can't give it the oomph anymore. So we activate it and go, and we're really, really slow. Okay. Now, the beautiful thing about this is the way that we're going to rehab this basal ganglion. Number one is we've got to do all the metabolic testing with this. You cannot slow down this process. If somebody had, already has Parkinson's tremor, you're not going to fix that. Nobody's going to fix that. We're just trying to get a problem solved where it will slow down and not go into this other extremity. If you come in with, with Parkinson's in the right hand, if you tell me you want that Parkinson's tremor to stop, I'm not going to take you as a patient because that's not going to happen. I want to, what we're going to do is we're going to give you the best opportunity to prevent this from going to this hand, to keep you from pooping on yourself, to keep you from peeing on yourself, to keep you from getting in a wheelchair and somebody shoving a food a tube down your throat for you to eat and not die from asphyxiation. Now, if you can accept the truth, Mr. Patient, then I will accept you for care, but nobody's going to stop this. Okay. All right. So, the beautiful thing here is, is that, all right, so the left, the left brain, the right brain controls the left side of the body. So what we can do here is with this right brain, right basal ganglion controlling the left side of the body, guess what happens? The cerebellum on this side, the cerebellum over here, okay, what it does is it actually fires to the exact same, uh, the exact same thalamus that fire through this loop in the basal ganglion. So we can actually use the cerebellum to rehab the basal ganglion, all right? The frontal lobe, any part of this frontal lobe, parietal lobe or temporal lobe, all we have to do is find out which area is bad. Somebody has hallucinations. That means like, for example, you're not supposed to have hallucinations. So hallucinations are firing through the, the temporal lobe and the indirect pathway. You see how this works? If you have post-traumatic stress disorder, you have bad thoughts. It's your limbic system firing through this indirect pathway and the indirect pathway can't gate your thoughts. So you got negative thoughts all the time. If you have problems sleeping at night, one of the reasons for that is this indirect pathway is not activating and you're sitting here, you know, twirling your thumbs kind of uh, just, you know, like a like an old record from the 80s. It just keeps skipping. It's called rumination, okay? ADHD fires through this indirect pathway, uh, autism. So you start to see it's not just a motor problem. It's a cognitive problem because the, your cognitive loops fire through this as well. Your limbic systems fire through this, this rage, uh, panic, okay? All of these fire through here. And if this indirect pathway is damaged, then you look at this person and go, why in the world are you so panicked? You know, like we were talking about earlier, Linda and JT and I, before everybody came on, we were talking about uh, people who are claustrophobic. This part of this problem is a brain-based problem where this indirect pathway is abnormally functioning. They panic when they put this mask on. So they literally have to stand there with their mask on with their hand and God forbid if they were to put, you put them in a hyperbaric chamber. There's nothing physically wrong. It's an emotional aspect here. That limbic lobe says that they're in damage, uh, danger. So please understand that this, this cortex is not just a motor cortex. It's parietal cortex. It's temporal. It's occipital. It's parietal, uh, uh, temporal, limbic. All of these areas fire through the direct and indirect pathway. And the way we're going to rehab that is with this, uh, we got to do a neurological exam to find out is it right brain, left brain, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and we can do that if you know how to do a neurological exam, a functional neurological exam. And then this right brain, this right cortex is going to fire through the basal ganglion through the direct and indirect pathway. So we can use the cortex that's damaged here to excite that, but if it's on the right side, guess what we can do? We can actually rehab the cerebellum on the contralateral side because they share the exact same thalamus uh, that, that, that fires through the direct and indirect pathway. The cerebellum fires that thalamus. So see, if you don't understand the anatomy, you can't play the game. And then we can use vertical eye movements, okay, to, to, do, to activate uh, the mesencephalon. Then we can also uh, use a metronome where we can have patients clap their hands. Okay. We can have patients do rock, paper, knife to a metronome. Okay. 
We can have patients do toe tap to a metronome. So again, we what we want to do if they have an end, if they have a direct pathway that's damaged, what we want to do is we want